Do you like conversation on a variety of topics? Feel like no one wants to talk about the things that interest you? Tired of only hearing the same political, sports, or catastrophe talk? Yeah, we feel that way too. Join two high-functioning geeks as they discuss just about anything under the sun. We can't tell you what we'll be talking about each week because we don't know where our brains will take us. It will be an interesting conversation, though, so hang on and join us. Here comes the Relentless Geekery. Fit in by changing things to what they might need, but then by changing them back after they were done, that doesn't happen anymore. Everybody acts as if they're the only thing on your machine, or they act as if they they want to force you to be their only thing because they keep detuning other things. So right, right. Is that better? Much better now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, 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 it's like you gotta go through the settings every time you do a reboot, and you know that's the only way to solve a tech problem is a reboot. So yeah, but it, that's kind of weird. You would think that you know, like a reboot should leave things as they were when you last were on. Uh, there are certain, uh, I'm trying to think, maybe like, like a hearts game that I occasionally play that I stopped playing after a while because it puts the window in an odd place on your screen. And instead of leaving it where you move it to the next time you come back, seemingly a trivial thing, but it just is, man, this is a solved problem for, let's call it 30, 40 years now. <laughs> Windows 3.1. Yeah, the, the <laughs> position and the size and the font and the whatever else you do to tune it to you, especially, I mean, I used to do that a lot where I really wanted it to look just like what I wanted it to look on my desktop or in various different window sets and stuff. And if you do all that work and then they take it away from you, it's like, you just wasted my time. That's a card. Right. Don't lose data. Don't waste my time. I you used know? to, I used to do that. Um, but I end up having so many different combinations of different windows, depending on what I'm doing that right. I would choose the spot for this, but then I opens up and it covers it up. So I end up moving things around anyway, but let me tell you, you know, as well as I do, two monitors is really the way to go if you're doing any type of real work in development. Absolutely. And in fact, I, that's exactly what I have. And, and they're both big. So it really is that I, I, I know I've read multiple times that um, the multitasking is really a less efficient way to do things. than if you just single focus, but if you're the equivalent of on call, you need to be able to monitor what's going on from multiple input sources and not have it buried under other things, then that's what I usually do is, you know, here's my calendar and here's my uh, messages window and whatever else it might be. And I don't keep glancing at them as if I'm distracted, but they're there so that when they alert me, you know what I mean? So it's that right. fine tune between don't let you don't distract yourself, but have it available to you when somebody needs to get through. And, you know? and there's still things that have to process uh, like the podcast, the audio, uh, when I export it, it can take two and a half minutes, which doesn't seem long unless you have a to-do list that's a mile long. Right, <laughs> you, know? you don't want to stare at it, wasting yeah. time while it's doing it. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, I literally have had Audacity exporting something with the video editor also exporting to the format for YouTube, and I check my email, you know, and I got code up here. So it's bouncing back and forth at times because you're waiting. Yeah. In fact, I just got a book called Beautiful Code that is about how coders, you know, work and how they know what they're doing. And one of the things that really struck me is I bet you that's a very personal thing. I know that how I like to have things on screen when I'm in coding mode and I have like a development and a test and a production environment and I have a, a database monitor on it, whatever else might be going on, web stuff, uh, CPU monitoring, all the things. I really like to have them in a certain place on my screen because I want my eyes to go to what I'm mostly working on, but then the alert should be um, where it should be. I don't know how to say that, you know, like after you've played with it a little bit and you get to where you like to respond the right amount, you don't want to panic, but you don't want to miss it. I really, and, and if anything, just even whether it's on the left or the right, you know, where do I glance when I'm typing? I want it to be front and center, right. but if what you're, anyway, it's, there must be some um, psychological insight as to how people arrange things when they really do have to have half a dozen windows open on their screen and how do they do that it's kind of like a drummer having a drum kit you know once you expand beyond your standard eight piece or whatever like that when you see you'll see how neil pert or carl palmer or uh, uh, keith moon had their drum kit set up they really had a very specific set of yeah. here's where i want my main tom toms and my hi-hat and my crotales you know what i mean if that's how you say that i never said that out loud before it it just it's that little yeah. thing where you you run a drumstick across and it goes Ring. right it's like little hanging bars so 
I that, that's that's really a cool thing. Like they must have experimented with that, and then they had a rig built so that put these things exactly the same way each show. I don't want my drum tech to be off by an inch, and then I'm not hitting the sweet right. spot. I really need to have it that I'm going into unthinking mode while I play, and everything has to be where you expect it in order to be able to do that. You Very much. I mean? so, and yeah. and uh, you know, I'm. I've been talking about this for a year now, uh, upgrading my system. And I, I just, out of the blue, said, you know what? Maybe I'll uh, see what I can do to get a three monitor setup. And it's not necessarily the, oh, look at me on three monitors. That's a little bit of it. Okay. <laughs> but okay. I find with the two, I've got them kind of at an angle and I'm, I'm glancing between them all the time. You know, with a three, I can shift that, keep the main, like you said, main stuff focus flat on and periphery stuff email uh, music player you know on the sides exactly that's so, why i have my, i mean I'm, I'm looking right at my main screen which is um big like i don't know 25 26 inches i'm trying you know and my slightly smaller screen is at a like here's my main screen and then this guy is at this angle and if when i get a third one it'll be like this so it's kind of a wraparound thing you know right. even like car instrumentation is like that too man when you get into a rental car and and for a while when i was traveling i got into many in a minute you could see these guys have never driven with anybody but the most standard 58 man in a car if you're any <laughs> short, shorter or taller then all of a sudden the crossbar of your steering wheel is cutting off your speedometer what the f you can't yeah. have that happen. And yet both Colleen and I being rodents of unusual size, you know, she being five and my being <laughs> both three, ends of the spectrum. <laughs> absolutely. We right. And just like, how do you reach for things? It should kind of wrap around you instead of the further you get to the right, the further you have to reach and the more you have to oh, yeah. stop looking over there and all of a sudden, oh, there's the truck. So there's, and I, I, it's kind of funny. I hadn't, I mentioned last time one of the things I wanted to cover, and this is a perfect segue into that. There's a guy named Donald Norman who has written a number of great books about design, about human centered design, about the psychology of design. And in fact, I think his first book used to be called um, The Design of Everyday Things. And then the second edition that they changed it to The Psychology of Everyday Things because it goes into like really great design does that anything from jonathan ivy from apple makes it that it's not only perfect utility but it like feels right right in, right under on your desk it it invites you it um and and, and the, you know, norman goes into all kinds of well here's examples of bad design and, it, and it's almost like the stereotypes you know of here's a door that you're not sure whether you should push or pull the kind of bar that it has doesn't invite the, either one of those. It's anonymous. And I think if I remember it right, on the cover of the book, it has a steam kettle where if you pour it, the steam will go on your hand. <laughs> the spout is positioned exactly foolishly for a potentially dangerous situation. And he's really, really insightful about going into all kinds of good and bad examples. And honestly, the first edition was published like 40 years ago. So there are some companies that embrace that. And you can tell things that are beautiful, things that you want to have forever. They fit your hand, the perfect right. knife, whatever else it might be. And we are still surrounded by how many times have you stood in a store and like picked up a tool and said, this is an invitation to injury. This is just, it's, it's wrongly balanced. It's like where you plug it in is in, it's sure to tangle. What, yeah. what are they thinking when they do this? Well, oh, we, wow. I got a Darth Vader toaster. I mean, come on, Star <laughs> Wars toaster. It puts Darth Vader's head on the toast. That's perfect, isn't it? That's wonderful. Sitting on the counter, Darth Vader's head, you know, right. it looked great. <laughs> except all the controls were on the back. His head was on the front. So we had to turn it so the head's facing the wall just to use the damn toaster. And then and, you can't tell the coolness right. of it. And mm -hmm. the slots were super thin only for sliced bread, homemade bread, bagels. Nope, forget it. Exactly. So, so you know, yeah. Use. In fact, I, you know, even like for computers, you would think, uh, like, I don't know, I put um, all my, I, I like where my cords are on the back of the machine and I, I kind of gather them so that they're not dangling where I can kick them out or get caught or anything like that. But there are some things that if you are regularly plugging in or out USB things, you want at least one of those ports on the front, right. on the hard drive, on your monitor, whatever else it might be. Some people have caught on to that. And some people, they, they over design and say, no, that'll ruin the aesthetic of it. I want this to be the perfect glass slate and I'm not going to have anything disturbing it. Well, then you've, you've lost the utility or they'll put the port on the bottom of the monitor. You mean where it'll fall right out? Where if you don't have whatever the, the engineering is so that it's nice and tight, but not too tight. It, it's just the weirdest thing. The 
the compromises or the decisions that people make where it's like, you know, that's not going to work long term. You know, that's not the right thing to do. And yet that's why you oh, buy a powered USB hub to keep on the corner of your desk. <laughs> and, and, and I exactly it, it, it's kind of funny. Some things I, I, there's a whole philosophy of this, you know, essence, it, 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 which which comes first essence or existence? Is it utility that drives things to exist? Or do we give things utility based on it? And I'm mixing between what's really going on. There. But <laughs> in computer things, it really is. I don't really, I have no need for everything to look beautiful as long as it has great utility. Right. I want my plugs to stay plugged in. I want the power cord to be obvious as to where it goes and no danger. No, you know, it doesn't get tangled with anything. Oh, well, it's. And we talked about that with Linux, <laughs> that how they've come a long way, but compared to Apple and even Microsoft Windows, the, the usability that it's just, there's certain things that's like, really, I've got to do that. I install a program. I do all these great things. Open it up. It's like, where's the close button? Where's the menu? They, they, you know, it's not normal or it looks different. And it's like that. And, and I can get that because my brain's a developer brain. It's on off logical analytical. Okay. Well, look at all this great function we have. Well, yeah, but it looks like crap. You know, well, who right. cares? We've got great function. <laughs> exactly. All the uh, classic overloading of you can't have one button serve six purposes without it being obvious what mode it's in for you to be able to do what's right. <laughs> in fact, it, it's segue day today. I think I mentioned I really wanted to talk about Roku today yes. because I just had one of the best experiences of my tech life. Wow. I, uh, so here, uh, a problem to be solved. Colleen and I love watching the Olympics. Winter Olympics are coming up starting Friday with the opening ceremonies, but already like today is curling. Um, in the past, we've had to deal with most, like most of what we... It, it, <laughs> see, I can't do that. You can do the, the bun. I can only do the hot dog. <laughs> I, I can't, I've never been able to curl my tongue. I, it, it, so. It's now an Olympic sport, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, it, you know, there. I know that people talk about that. Of all the things that are otherwise genetic markers, you know, what color your <laughs> eyes, the tongue roll is you can or you can't. You can't right. learn how to... You, like, lack the muscle, nerve, whatever. So, yeah. But anyway, so... Uh, we have in the past been trapped to well if we don't get like espn and pay out the wazoo in order right. to be able to watch it because they've probably over the last 20 years they've tried various different packages and bundles of you can watch everything every single hour and then you can do it like if it's not on network tv it's at least on where you can dvrf and then if you wanted to watch every beach volleyball game or whatever else that's the stuff that usually goes on at two in the morning i take it back that's often now in prime times because hey near naked but anyway, it, it um, we have tried to watch like, is network TV going to be enough? And that means you're sitting in front of your TV from like 8 to 11 East Coast time every night. And oh my God, you get inundated with the worst advertising in the world. We already object to when we watch our Wheel of Fortune and our Jeopardy. And nowadays, Ohio is going through with, with the election, how many? 10 months away. Terrible, garbage, lying evil ads about and we're going to talk about that later too <laughs> we'll talk about that later too but it just is i don't want to invite that into my life right. there's no way on network tv to turn that off unless you get a dvr like tivo or something like that and then be able to fast forward through them so i started to explore this year we're going to solve that problem so um i i got the latest uh latest and greatest roku roku ultra like 70 bucks so inexpensive compared mm -hmm. to the life-changing functionality that this has. I already have a Samsung smart TV and it already has apps for all different kinds of what we most watch for, for uh, Netflix, for Amazon, for Hulu, et cetera, et cetera. Um, every one of those has slightly different interface. So they never got the news on, hey, interface guidelines would say, if you want your users to be happy, make it that they're similar enough so that you're never having to hesitate as to how do I get back from here? How do I page around? I only have a remote I really need to be able to like handle that without the usual mouse or keyboard. Right. Some have done it really nicely, others not. I also remember from a couple of times, one of the reasons that I kept my uh, Netflix password short and foolishly hackable was because Netflix had, had problems probably every year where it would say, hey, we need you to verify who you are, put in your Netflix password. If you're trying to put in a 30 character password with a remote on the keyboard that doesn't look like a 40 <laughs> keyboard, but it's like, and it just is, if you make a single mistake, it, it, I think you, you usually can back off of it, but it's just painstaking yeah. and, and terrible. So 
I was expecting that same terrible experience by going to Roku, all the work pain that I had put into making sure that my Amazon was set up, my network was set up. Nope, go to the I, web. <laughs> I, it's, it, it, nowadays they have it, then instead of having to enter your password, you can actually say, hey, um, use your phone or your laptop to go to the web, put in, you know, netflix.com slash activate. It shows you a, a code on screen. You type it in here. It's on your same Wi-Fi network. It has its own individual address so it can talk to the television. Netflix makes sure that it doesn't get confused about what Samsung TV I have. So it really does talk correctly and store correctly and all that kind of stuff. And seven different things that I added, that's kind of a weird thing to say, seven different things. But I, I don't, you know, as I mentioned before, I kind of have currently... Uh, the free version of Disney Plus, the free right. version of HBO Max, etc. But instead of it being that painstaking, oh my God, I'm going to put in my designed to be unbreakable password seven, eight different times with this painstaking stupid. No, it was easy. And yeah. In fact, it was so easy. That then you kind of go browsing amongst the channels and say, you know, I don't currently have um, Hoopla on my TV, but now I can add Hoopla. I can add PBS, things that are that are free instead of being for pay. And what I was anticipating being honestly like a whole Sunday afternoon's work, I was done in like half hour, 45 minutes right. last night. And, and um, I, one of the things I did was I got Peacock so that that's where NBC is going to have everything. And right. I think it's where it's going to have not only in real time where I still have to worry about advertising, but you can buy a version of Peacock premium, apparently an even more strutting Peacock that is ad free. And so after honestly, talking about it and like not doing it for five olympics i guess 10 because there's a winter and a summer we finally think that we're going to have a we can and and like you go into peacock and you go to the olympics tab and it shows you everything the whole schedule or if you want to zoom in on i don't really care about uh ice dancing but let's make sure we don't miss curling um it, <laughs> it's so easy and relatively elegant to get to what you want and i i just couldn't be happier for all the pre-worry that I was doing, yeah. the angst I was already experiencing with, God, this has been such a hassle every single time I've done this. Instead, it was zippity wonderful, except Disney Plus. Disney Plus, because it goes through a provider, like when I when I, I have my HBO Max, oh. if I remember correctly, instead of going directly to Disney Plus, you have to go through a provider and they're like, uh, HBO Max had, are you coming in with your own name and password or do you have a provider? And it had a thing for that. Disney Plus is uh, uh, interface on Roku? Nope, not even doesn't even exist. I tried various different combinations of can I put in because for I have it through um, Amazon, if I remember correctly, I've tried putting in my I have a different password there than here. I tried every combination I could could have and I couldn't get it to say sure you're on Disney Plus now. So it's not like Disney Plus is my life. But what's one of the reasons that I want to hold on to it, I probably will get it after the six month uh, the teaser package because if you've had a chance to watch the DC stuff and the, and the uh, Star Wars stuff, you really don't want to give it up. You know well, what I but, mean? There's enough goodness there. But um, if you uh, <laughs> signed up for it through Amazon or whatever it is, you can still access it through the Amazon Prime app. It, it, and that I will end up doing that. They have in the overall, the fallback is they have like you can go to a web browser and get in and sign on. But I kind of wanted it to be that here's my block oh, of channels, right. if you will. You know what yeah. I mean? So. Uh, it just, I, I guess, hats off to Roku. I mean, I've been an investor with them for a long time because I love that they are the best aggregator and no matter what other companies have attempted to dethrone them, nobody has been able to match their everything, their ease of use, their access to the most number of different channels. Everybody has a presence on Roku. Um, I have I have a number of music channels. So in case I want to bring up Pandora or Spotify, you know, and like, so right. I, it's kind of funny. I always feel a little weird. Of, I'm going to use this whole, whole huge TV as the equivalent of what used to be a crystal radio. You know what I mean? Right. And it's cool. Like to, it's just so nice to have everything in one place and have it all work, yeah. that the interface is relatively constant, that the Amazon remote uh, sorry, the, the Roku remote feels good in your hand. Things are where you expect them to be. It's got voice recognition. So instead of only clicking around, you can say, uh, you know, show me Casino Royale. Yes. Find me Casino Royale. It'll and tell it, you where it, it streams. Oh, my God. It's yeah. life-changingly cool. See, and why, I, I didn't resist it, but I just didn't realize how good it was for so long. Yeah, wow. it, I, I agree. Uh, we've got, like, Discovery Plus and CBS and we had them separate uh, so we could get them on the apps, but it was like, 
Well, let's see it's on Discovery. Let's see it's on CBS and we're switching. So we switched all that and we subscribed to it through an Amazon Prime channel. So now we just bring up Amazon Prime and it's the aggregator for like four different stations. Uh, along have to with look the, into that too instead of having yeah. it to be Okay. So, okay. I mean, we, we still get the exact same shows uh, and pay the same price. It's just one time through it. Again, we've said it before, yeah. we're bringing back cable just to, the new format right but instead of 150 <laughs> channels 120 of which you don't watch anyway now it really is that you choose which ones right. actively so and actually when i was first looking for amazon prime i was like well, where is it i go i went from you know something to america it's like oh it's prime video they don't yeah. have amazon in the name so that was like well, that was the one glitch of boy amazon if you're looking to build a brand i would have thought that you'd sprinkle amazon because there's amazon music there's they have other things where they did include the name right. why not do the grouping of all the amazons i thought that was odd i agree and it it's one also benefit of having like an xbox or playstation console all those same apps are on those consoles and you can get all of them and watch yeah. um and we got we had an ultra and it died so we got a stream bar so we got the okay. surround and it's the sound exactly yes. i looked at that too i was curious about that okay it was on sale right before christmas so it was like 30 dollars more in the ultra so i was like ah it's good sound for the uh live or bedroom but you can get external speakers so you can get a full surround and you can hook up that so i was like okay that's cool okay i like this we got all of our channels we just you know signed into our account and all our channels came right back we didn't have to miss anything it was great right reload re yeah uh, but mm -hmm. talking about the user interface like we were a couple minutes ago the ultra has that little button on top you press it and your remote dings and you can find it find those, it's kind of like looking for one of those old chirping things at times yeah. but the stream bar does not have that why why does it not have the stupid little find my remote button yeah yeah <laughs> do we have pretty good habits about that you know we have a not a coffee table but a, a tray table if you will that we have in front of us in the tv room and that's where all the remotes go instead of them falling into the couch or carrying right. it to the other room for some reason right you really have pretty well, good uh, remote hygiene <laughs> i do that just absent-mindedly oh cool and i walk out of the room uh yeah. set it down somewhere go back i'm like where's the remote and then i'm like treasure hunt but we also have a couple cats and they like to play with everything. So I, I lost my glasses and everybody gets on me about that because I'm horrible about just flipping them up top of my head, walking and setting them down. And it'll be days later and somebody says, hey, uh, did you get a movie off the top of the media center? I'm like, no, they're like, oh, well, your glasses are up there. <laughs> oh, up there. that's right. That's, that's where they went. All exactly. the time. <laughs> so I've been looking for my glasses, my reading glasses. I have computer glasses, reading glasses and i couldn't find them and everybody's like well of course you always lose them like eh, whatever well here the cats had been bamping them and like we have a couple pillows on the floor for the dogs and cats when they come in they're in the bedroom they had yeah. bapped it like into the pillowcase of the pillow oh and I'm man like, yeah, who would look there yeah <laughs> i didn't do that <laughs> That's very, uh, we, we do not currently have any pets that would be that extra, I mean, just like a small child, right? You know, they, they take your keys and all of a sudden the keys are like in their toy box. And you're yeah. like, what? what? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, let me tell you this story. Colin, <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> yeah, when he was eight ish, around that age, um, he's got bad eyesight, but he's also got that tracking issue where uh, when things move, like he's the opposite of dinosaurs. You know, dinosaurs would see something move and they'd go after it. Well, when he sees something move, it actually disappears in his visual acuity. He can't see it. Uh, and we found that out when he was playing baseball <laughs> because he kept oh, saying, boy. I can't see the ball. We're like, well, keep your eye on. He's like, but I can't see it. It's gone. But you know, if it's moving, it's gone. Yes. Exactly. Okay. You know, and that took us a while to discover. Well, okay. he has glasses and they're a little thicker, not Coke bottles, but still in a different prescription for the eyes. Try It didn't help the. Uh, tracking but you know and he, he can mostly see far away but he can see up close you know it's one of those things i feel bad for the kid okay. so his glasses always cost a little more than the insurance covered and we made sure to get good ones because he's a kid you know that good right. you yeah. do it if there's going to be any corrective factor or just to make him have a better world right I, okay. okay so um we got a new pair and after insurance we still paid like 150 bucks after insurance paid for stuff and we always take care of your glasses so that night it was like halloween we went to my cousins they were playing in a 
a thing. They went trick-or-treating, went home. He went to bed, got up the next morning. He's walking around. He goes, I can't see anything. I'm like, well, go put your glasses on. He says, I don't know where they're at. Oh, God. No, when did you classes. lose them? Go no. check your bed. And we looked everywhere. No, couldn't find them. Okay, wait. We were at Gary's. I remember him having them at Gary's. Uh, so uh, we, were, we went and they had picked up the leaves. We're like, oh, God, please tell me they didn't get not in into fire. a bag. And off yeah. The oh, yeah. Man, okay. You know, we looked all over it. Couldn't find them. Had to go back, get a brand new pair. Nothing covered. So it was like $400 glasses after we just paid $150. Yes. Couldn't find them at all. Two years later, he was walking down with the old glasses. I'm like, what the heck? He says, well, you remember when we went to Gary's? I was looking at my baseball cards, and I wanted to be good and not lose my glasses, so I put them in the baseball card box to wow. keep them safe, and then he forgot all about them. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> my daughter was even worse. She went to a friend's birthday party, came home, and didn't have her glasses. We're like, where's your glasses? We called them. They're like, we have no idea. We don't see them anywhere. We looked, everybody looked, no idea. Here, she was one of those kids that just has to, like, she would find things in a cigar box wrapped in a blanket on the bottom of her toy box. That was her choice to keep it safe. But right. the glasses, <laughs> she stuck them between the headrest and the seat of the friend's car. And it was in there for like a month before they saw them and said, here, <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> I anyway keep them, to keep them safe but keep yes. them where you might see luckily I, I don't know boy as i think back the, the only time i hardly ever lose anything i really do have what i talked about having remote hygiene i have that pretty well i always put when i come home my sunglasses and my glasses uh, uh my keys they all go in a certain place and that way when i'm getting ready to, ready to go out they're almost always there earplugs for when we're going to a concert they go to a certain place and so because i do that 99 percent of the time it really is baffling to me like what broke down here it is possible when you come in you get interrupted and that's when you put them down for a moment knowing you'll just pick them up again but then you move on in your life so that has hardly ever happened way long ago I, this is an amazing story i was down at i was down at university of illinois and was uh, we we my girlfriend uh, Lisa and I then went and saw the Fourth of July parade, and while we were walking along, somehow my keys fell out of my pocket of my shorts, and they shouldn't have. You know what I mean? There were deep pockets, et cetera, et cetera. But I really didn't have my keys. We retraced our path following the route of the parade and everywhere else that we could think of. Is this where we popped over for for kettle corn or something like that? And I actually found them on the street amongst parade rubble, like at wow. the curb. I couldn't believe it because at same thing at U of I, like I don't have money to replace these keys. I don't even know that I can get them. It wasn't only my keys. It was, I have a key to Garcia's or the Cyril, the, the, the computer lab or whatever else it might be. And I'm, I'm going to have to like, kind of like losing your wallet. You kind of got to walk your, work your way through your life and say, what am I missing? Keys, luckily, no one would find them and say oh now we have access to al's life and let's go steal his car it was but it just was the amazing amount of hassle that led me to say i'm taking this walk again and i couldn't believe we found them and you know like i don't know when you're a kid you get all shaky happy for christmas and that kind of stuff but as you get older that just doesn't really seem to happen <laughs> i was shaking like a little puppy dog that just got a treat i couldn't believe we had found them i just Oh my, it was, it was such a wonderful, like, woohoo, right. dancing in the streets, literally. I just, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, whoever did this, luck gods, thank you very, very much. So. You gotta love that. Well, <laughs> if this gives you any indication of how often I I play the absent-minded professor and just set things down, because, and I, I, I mean, I, I don't know why I do it all the time. I think I have like priorities of things going on in my head and the top priority things my brain just focuses on. So things like where I set my keys down, that's not a big priority. My brain just ignores it. Like, you know, puts a filter on it. So for Christmas, Gina got me item trackers. I can literally put these yes. on things and on find things it on my phone. Them. From what I understand, that market is exploding. There's so yeah. many people have that that difficulty. You know, it's like, and like I said, I don't, I haven't gotten any of them because I really don't seem to have that problem. Colleen a little bit more than me because she just, um, like when we've done this, when we're getting ready to go, one of us, not both of us, 
we will i used to like hey let me get the door for you let me uh, get your bag into the car for you she just had a, a trip yesterday and so i did that for her but what i've learned to not do is hover because then you feel that sense of urgency about getting out the door and all of a sudden she'll be on the road she didn't get both her pairs of glasses that she needs she didn't get the charger for her various devices she didn't you know what i mean it'll be and and now i i kind of sometimes will run through a list of all the things that one or the other of us has forgot over the course of time and that helps but the best thing to do is how about if i go move the car and get out of your sight and out of your attention and then we'll have our big goodbye kiss and hug when it's not the distraction from you making sure that you have all right. your stuff. <laughs> and, you know what i mean yeah it's a service that we give to each other of, That's nice. sometimes i'll get like i one one time i went to costco and i had like didn't have my wallet and like well i have money but you don't have the costco card and it was because in that act of heading out we had that last conversation about what to get and i was putting things into my phone and then i put the phone in my pocket but didn't realize i hadn't yet put the wallet in the pocket yeah. and 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 the penalty there is just like 20 minute drive away so am i really going to go home and come back or am i gonna oh well it was it was well i an uh, affirmation that i need to <laughs> before i go out that door just stop for a minute pat myself to a spectacles testicles wallet keys you know what i mean when you cross yourself <laughs> that kind of thing i just i've gotten really good about making sure that my pockets have the right things in them. If I need a pen, is the pen in the right place? I used to check for that all the time. Nowadays, who uses a pen? Uh, yeah. I used to have a pen in my pocket, a Swiss army knife in my pocket until that started to be, well, sir, here at the airport, uh, we're I going to make too. you send that home to yourself. Yeah. And after it cost me, honestly, like three times, because I had that good habit of always having that handy thing with me, I've now paid, you know, not a hundred dollars, but hundred and sixty dollars, because three times twenty, I had to send yep. that effort home to me. I, I did the I same wasn't thing. Confiscate it. Oh right. well, so yeah. they broke me of some habits. <laughs> well, um, you mentioned earlier we were talking about Roku, um, and we, we, I also like the Roku even without the remote because the app you can control it through your phone. So, okay. uh, you I know, it, downloaded exactly. Yeah, yes. you know, so I do have that. But of course, you know, most of the time by the end of the day, my phone's almost dead. So <laughs> you know, it still doesn't help. But you mentioned Spotify and you and I are, are big advocates of buy the music uh, disc. So you have a disc. Yes. Sometimes I know there's a lot of artists now that you can't get a disc, you can't, uh, obviously you're not getting a cassette tape right. they but, don't release an lp or right. a cd or a yes only right this. so yeah. I, I try and go to like amazon or someplace and buy the actual mp3 so i can own it even if it's just digitally owned on the, my drive um because all and i know we aren't you know millennials we're not gen z's uh their outlook is totally different they well we have all the streaming services but you know how much music you're missing there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, Zeppelin hasn't been on Spotify. Um, uh, what's the, uh, uh, the the country artist? Um, huge. Um, Friends in Low Places. Uh, oh, Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks, he yes. hasn't been on Spotify. And I sent you a news item. I'm not aware of what's not there because I don't go out there often enough to right. see the lack. I, I might use that or Pandora when it's like, I don't care what I'm hearing, but I'm going to use one of my channels. Give me the prog rock channel. And then I'll just hear as if the radio, but all music right. I really do want to hear. Anyway, right. okay. So, so I mean, you, you, there's certain things you can't listen to. And sometimes they come and go, or you get a musical and there's uh, nine of the 12 songs that you can listen to. And the other three, you can't, you know, so. Yes. And I just sent you a news article and we talked about this a while back that Joe Rogan, I believe is his name. Right. They, they paid him like a million dollars to do his news Spotify podcast spouting all the stuff against government and garbage, disinformation exactly. and, and Neil Young spoke out against it. So they kicked him off of Spotify. So you can't get Neil Young any longer on Spotify yeah. because so did they, they kick him off. I thought he took his own music off. Oh, I see. I read that they kicked them off. Okay, because now other artists are in 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 solidarity with him, saying, "I don't want to be on Spotify if you're this disinformation fire hose for right. Rogan and other idiots like that." Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So I mean, the, just the and it speaks to yeah that things can go away. You know yeah. What I mean? that I right. Thought I had the ability to listen to and <laughs> just 
Neil Young is one of the few voices that I really can't stand to listen to. So when I read about that, it was like, no big loss for me. But anyway, <laughs> but, oh, no. did they take Elvis Costello as well? Oh, no, because I can't stand his voice. Either. But anyway. <laughs> but the, the point is, if you do like those artists, you don't own and control that. There's no guarantee. So, exactly. And it's not, and even the stuff you do own, you don't own. Um, I've had, okay, so i love getting like the marvel comics because they have that code so i put it on digitally i don't want to read the comic uh yeah. movies have that where you can get the digital version along with the disc because then exactly. i can you know oh this storage spot out in the garage we just put the disc because we have it digitally if i ever need it i can get it right you can go and get the original if you will exactly right. okay back in the early days i had a few of them through apple itunes you entered the code and it was on apple itunes well they decided, yeah, we're not going to support that anymore. So they're gone. So certain movies that I had purchased and owned, I can't even watch because I don't Dude, really doesn't own Doesn't that it. seem like shady, if not illegal? Like uh, yes. The, the deal you got when you bought that was not only to have the physical thing. If you bought it through Apple, it was that you get the additional services of being able to watch it on their online thing and them cutting That's that off. It seems like I'm sure it's in the fine print somewhere that says access is not guaranteed through all digital. And yet, that's uh, i i had we, we talked a little bit about this i had that same experience to me luckily early where i uh digitized a kansas album and you know uh, when you use um, apple music it it uh uses their right. version on their right. server instead of yours and one song was missing and i don't know what did it was it a rights conflict was it that something and like I love listening to albums all the way through. When you get to this track, segues into this track, and then it's missing, it's like I'm missing a tooth in my mouth. It's the weirdest. And yet there was never any explanation. If they've added it back now, I kind of really, they've already lost me in terms of ever trusting them because that right. happened two or three times where something was not quite right. It wouldn't digitize, it wouldn't, or, and we've talked about this before, the miracle of the CDDB where it was able to, when you, when you first, um, ripped something uh it gave you the track names because it had that fingerprint of what the various different length lengths of songs were that it could uniquely identify each of the various different cds so how wonderful except when the person who put that information in the first place got it wrong they spelled the word wrong right and, and they have like you know they don't have a capitalization versus small case standard and i got for a while i'm sorry if we've already talked about this I was one of those crusaders that would I would continually correct Fix it, it and then <laughs> upload a correction so that it would be back into their database. Somebody there somewhere was not just taking corrections because then any any idiot like Wikipedia, you know, it's it's only based on anybody can edit it, but somebody has to be conscientious enough to stop malicious editing from happening, if you will. Well, sometime at, at some point, I noticed that my corrections were not being accepted and there was no explanation, but it's like, man, I was doing you a solid. I was giving you a good service here by cleaning this up all the time. And now if I'm not seeing it happening that you've decided to freeze that database or that I'm, even though I had done, I don't know, dozens by then, I'm not a trusted contributor so that you would say Al really knows what he's doing. It just was alienating to me that now I'm gonna to have to put up with, wow. And, and how people put things in also really affects it, not only in terms of, here's the name of the song and it looks slightly wrong. If they put in, it's this person featuring somebody else, when you try to listen to the entire album, it starts to sort it so that that's where it skips things. If you, you know, if you've got uh, right. um, something is co-written by multiple people, and that that it puts it as if it's a separate album instead of the same music collection oh, yeah. i started to have to create virtual albums all kinds of playlists to just get the thing to play like i want it to play and after a while that level of overhead was too much so i i duly digitize everything still but i'm aware that apple music and i guess is it let's see i think apple music is now their spotify version where everything is out there instead it's just the the app the music app is where I have, wow, thousands, as you might imagine, of CDs that are pretty much what I have um, curated better. And I'm aware that that will never match up to what the mainstream world has. Right. So, and, and in fact, I, 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 we must, I, I have pet peeves about this. Hope you don't know. Like, wow, I have the, my CDs have always been alphabetized in my shelves so that I could find whatever I wanted to listen to right away. It wasn't, yeah, I listened to it. And so it's kind of chronological. It wasn't by genre. It really was A to Z. 
Well, when you switch to using Apple Music and you find out that, oh no, Jethro Tull is indeed under J because there is a Jethro Tull, but um, Neil Young well, is under Y to me because it's a real person, not the name of a band. So it's Young, comma, Neil. Nope, to them it's Neil Young. And especially when you have things where it changes a lot, like Frank Zappa is not under Z, but it's under F. And I had to move a whole Zappa section over here to the F section and move a whole bunch of stuff down, which really the ripple effect was catastrophic because I have huge CD shelves. Catastrophic isn't over. It was a lot of hassle. But you know what first, I mean? first world catastrophic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh my my world ended, Stephen. I'm telling you. I'm well, telling you worse, worse yet, you're talking about the CDDB and even the online <laughs> stuff. Because I used Amazon music similarly for a while. Um, but they would have a few albums Jethro Tall and then a few albums Tall, comma Jethro. <laughs> Yeah, they weren't even consistent <laughs> exactly it makes you crazy and i really like it when i listen to something and the album cover pops up yeah that's gone the correct totally album down. cover the correct album cover i have things i don't know the eurythmics that it's got one eurythmic album cover for like six different albums yeah. they just don't have them and and in, in at first i fought it where i would go out to amazon or other places and and get a you know take a snapshot download the album put it in and and that seems to retain it and at one point they did some kind of upgrade and it reset it reverted everything to what their defaults are and all that work what and so like you you um, efforts i put a lot of work into my keeping my little garden clean right you are just continually kind of upsetting the cart here i have accepted that my standards are not theirs and they never will be but it still really irritates me when yeah. i don't have you know especially Wow, bands that put a lot of work into beautiful albums like Pink Floyd, yes. or Kansas, or you know what I mean? You get Marillion, and then it's one generic album cover instead of each of the album covers matches the music, it matches the time of it. It, it, it the album cover evokes its own back memories in me to be like, oh, I first heard this, but da, da, da. and if it's the wrong memory, then it's like jarringly over why. I don't know. That just seems like such a small thing to have gotten right, and they've abandoned it. Yeah. So I, I wish there was a club for people like me that would be where's Start the a service. The exactly. Old yeah. Music. The, the real CDDB. The corrected right. CDDB. You know, CD like the real Ghostbusters cartoon. Oh man. <laughs> so it, the, it, I mentioned that to you because Sunday, my cousin and I uh, wanted to get on Xbox and play Titanfall. That's one of the games that we enjoy because it. it I don't know. It's a little different than Call of Duty or Halo. Um, you're big giant robots, plus you're also running around and uh, we work yeah. together. I, I don't know. It, it just if it, it was a lot of fun, frenetic action. And right. even and though it I kind of itself in a way that it's not the same experience as every other first person. Shooter. Yeah, That's yeah. Cool. And we, yeah. we loved it. Yeah. So I had the disc and his wife had they bought it digitally um, and we played for many years this way. Well, then Games for Gold offered it for free in their Games for Gold one month. So, oh, great. I grabbed the Games for Gold uh, so I wouldn't have to have the CD all the time to put in. Right. And so we went to play Sunday and we're like, it's gone. Totally pulled out of my library the Games for Gold that they had said, here, because you paid for a month of gold, here's one of the free games. It's yours. Well, we're taking it back now. And my cousin who when they oh. bought the Xbox, this was a free game as a promo to get the Xbox, it was gone. Um, they just pulled it right out of our libraries. So we can't play the game unless we have the disc and we're local because we found oh. with Titanfall 2, right. the servers weren't letting us connect and play together. We, uh, we have to literally move to get in the same room to play local like it's 2001. <laughs> Oh man. Oh man. I sorry about that. I, that's kind of, I'm, I'm, we are, we can't be the only ones that have many examples of this. Of, right. Hey, it was free. And so we can take it back whenever we want. No, like if you had given me a gift, you can't come into my house and take back the, the vase you gave me. <laughs> right. It's, 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 it's the, it's a weird, I don't know, not a double standard. It's a weird inconsistency in expectation versus reality. That people could just cancel things and not only cancel it on yours, they took it out of how many? A hundred thousand? Oh, yeah, more. Yeah. 
you and, know, collections. Oh, man. you know, we mentioned, you know, to the Gen Zers and the millennials, it's not as big a deal. They don't even really notice. And I've pointed out, everybody's like, oh, ne for uh, when Netflix started, they were totally the bomb. I mean, you got the disc delivered. That was initial. And I still get disc delivered because there are discs that don't exist as digital. That's and like, one understands streaming is like, you know, 20,000 titles. Disc is like 100,000, yeah. 120,000. There's we, the way we work our way through our AFI lists or our all the John Sales movies or whatever we're watching lately. John Carpenter, by the way, is a guy I just decided to add as to I want to see every movie of his again. You know, we just watched a, a special about Halloween and the making of it. And like, I've always loved that he not only does the writing, directing, he does the music. Music, and yeah. it absolutely adds to the movie. It's always been very atmospheric, Halloween and the thing and, and uh, Big Trouble in Little China. And what, you know what I mean? Anyway. Yeah. So just, yeah. <laughs> and and um, so th that's, I remember Netflix had everything you know, back in the mid 2000s, uh, right. every movie in the theater, six months, eight months, a year later, it was on Netflix. And yeah. then the, everybody started parsing off Disney, we're creating our own pool, all the Disney. Right. So their own exclusive content. Yeah. Like that. The, the one I remember first really getting me BBC took its stuff away from all the various different services. And I don't think they necessarily intended to make their own service. They just wanted to cut a better licensing deal with whoever they were going to go to. But right. man, if you've been watching Doctor Who for 60 years, you can't do without your Doctor Who because right. somebody else is negotiating. So that was really a jarring thing. And, you know? <laughs> and the same with Roku. So my parents still subscribe to Spectrum Cable. Uh, because they've got the Western channel and that my dad watches that all the time. Okay. Um, so we had the Spectrum app on our Roku, just use their account. Uh, we could watch things that we rarely ever used it, but every now and then you get that show that's on sci-fi or something and it's nowhere else. So you want to watch it while you okay. can, but yeah. they lost the, the license deal with Roku and it got taken off. So you can't use the Spectrum app any longer. Right. It, you know, th there's got to be uh, a, like a little industry newsletter that talks about all of that. Hey, this is coming in. This is going out. What are the, the machinations behind the scenes that are leading to all of this? I kind of want to know I think, that, but what I really want is for I want to want it to work. Yeah, I want, just, it, to not, I want it to not get stop your heads working. out of your butts. Just let it work. <laughs> I think doesn't the, the the cord cutter website in that doesn't they oh, have that there they a, focus? There, yeah, that, that must be out there. That would make sense, you know, that, and that they're the ones that are finding the best deals and the, whoever's most current with the various different right. things. The fact that there's, boy, uh, there's so much content out there. When I, and in fact, back, let me back up. Another thing I liked about Roku was that they have um, a live local channels based on you put in like for, you know, I, it, it had the complete lineup. So now we have any number of times had to deal with, wow, we can't really watch Jeopardy tonight because there's bad weather and our little digital antenna, which is usually really good, it's artifacting. It's getting all this little blurring and stuff, so we can't watch it. And at one point, I was thinking of getting an Amazon Fire recast because it does that thing. It recaptures everything everywhere and then makes it available digitally. Uh, uh, not And so I found out that I probably won't need that now because Roku's live channels version at home gets all that stuff. And it was like going back to the first time that I was in a hotel room and it has that little thing that comes <laughs> yeah. on screen and you can pop down and see the, the listing. And so that was kind of handy to know that. But, but I, and I guess the way that, that ties into what we were just talking about is when I, the um, looking at how much is out there, there's 50 probably channels that are, that are like free over the air as well as digital and saw so many, wow. Um, reality TV, shopping shows, reruns. There was like old Dick Van Dyke, old. And I was just yeah. like, man, if I just was to divorce myself from the world and like hook up an IV and watch TV for the rest of my life, I would never run out. There's so much content. And not only, of course, all the old stuff, but there's new stuff. Yeah. Made Roku has its own original out. programming. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing how much is out there. Uh, for a long time, I've been, I've always thought of it this way. The minute that became like a Netflix, it wasn't about trying to find good stuff. It was like, man, you're drinking from the fire hose. How do you find the good stuff amongst all the crap? Yeah. Find the diamonds that are worth your time. And so it, it, it having just passed into February, but almost every January, one of the things I say is, you know, I really want to 
watch the best shows, read the best books, kind of get the crap that I sometimes end up watching at 11 o'clock at night when I don't know what to watch. Let's watch the latest Bruce Willis. Um, oh, he's an ex army guy that happens to be in town where there's white trafficking and he's going to save people there. They there's, you know, a number of performers, him, Dolph Lundgren, C. Thomas Howell that have gotten to that wonderful thing of, I don't need to be in a Hollywood blockbuster and make salary. I can churn these $5 million movies out that make $15 million. And who makes the 10? Me, not the studio. At least it seems that way, you know, yeah. the deals they've cut. So having said that, it's just amazing the amount of content that's out there. And that, like, we, we have done some things. We really do. We watch the AFI Top 100, both versions. We really try to watch the Oscar nominees each year. You know, if, even if we're watching... I don't know, I watch a lot of the genre stuff, like I mentioned Fringe, which I'm in love with, and, you know, The Sopranos and stuff like that, and some of those are award-winning, but some are not, and, and I still want to make sure that I'm watching that instead of the worst of it. So, you know, hey, you know, this is the Rentless Geekery podcast. There's very little geeky about every one of the talent shows. I just so much don't care about America's Got Talent and who's right. dancing with who, and you know what I mean? All the, this one's about kids and uh, cheerleader tryouts. There is nothing substantial about those shows that I will ever care right. about that I want to waste a minute on. And I guess, okay, but, everybody else who gets such joy out of those, but my life is about continually expanding and adding to and not just seeing the same thing. Yes. Again and again and again and again and again with right. slightly different costumes and slightly different players. And so we can segue to this. You and I both are not big sports fans. And why is that? Because out of a 162 game season, there's like 10 moments of real interest out of all those games and all those innings and all those at bats. There's 10 moments out of all that that I could care anything about. So why don't it's, it's a, it's a sop. It's something that they just, there's a comfort to it, that people really are big fans of their teams and they really want to see them do well. But then I see how much it affects their mood as to how they did well or poorly that day. Their life revolves really, around watching a oh franchise God. that these guys are earning millions for. Yes, yeah. exactly. This guy only got $150 million over 10 years. He got a raw deal. You know what I mean? They're, they're worried about the size of... Oh, and, and so... There's all some... of that about i really once again kind of reestablish. i really need there's only so much time in life you know what right. i mean i so much want to make sure that i fill it with quality instead of crap and yet the world is awash in crap there's yes. people that are fantastic crap taste meisters they know just what's going to get the public happy you know what i mean i, I was just listening to a podcast and the guy on there was talking about every activity having an opportunity cost and it's funny because I talk about that, that talk I, I keep mentioning that I'm doing uh, for the uh, Dayton Super Saturday Gifted Kids program uh, okay. in a couple of weeks. But um, that I, I talk about that, that where, where you put your passion and your focus. And I see these people where their passion and their focus is on spending time and money supporting a sports franchise. And then they complain about their job. They complain about their life. They complain that they don't, they're stressed. And it's like, well, maybe you need to put a different passion and focus and your opportunity cost of that. What's it costing you to sit and watch eight hours of football on a Sunday? On a Sunday. You yeah. know, whereas I can sit down and program a video game that might have some people playing on their phone and I might make a couple hundred bucks this month from that. So, you know, the opportunity right. cost of that game is much better than watching sports. Yeah. You know, I know I've, I've seen, there's a famous quote, uh, uh, I wish I could remember who it was from, because uh, I want to attribute it along the lines of the reason that this guy liked reading the sports pages is because it was, um, that's where you get good news and heroism compared to the rest of the newspaper, which is filled with bad news and tragedy. Well, maybe and that I, used I to mean, be true. And that meant exactly. <laughs> and, and so, but, and it's like, but still those little tiny dots of heroism, like I said, are few and far between to me, you know, like, it's kind of funny. Apparently the Cleveland Cavaliers, our basketball team is doing really well. And so they oh, show some spectacular plays and, and, you know, Hey, I could get behind, you know, these young kids, you know, that instead of having the, the burden of hey lebron james is on the team they have to do well they better do well or i'm going to be pissed instead it's like i love underdog stories you know the old gas house gang i, I read so much 
sports history compared to watching it. I don't know what what's that about, but that's kind of like where you get the distilled heroism story, if you will. Reading about, you know, Ernie Nevers and Bronco Nagurski and the, and the four horsemen of you know, and like it's cool to read that somebody put 72 points on the board against zero for the opponent, slinging Sammy Baugh. Boy, I'm 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 really in left field now. All the sports fans don't you know i really don't know all the sports trivia but you'd be surprised at the weird things i do now. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that it's i wish that i got more out of it and in fact it isn't uh, not we have to, i need to stop railing about sports there's all kinds of things that i do in my life that it probably would be best if do that to the minimum and spend all your time on what you're really good at that you're going to contribute to the world what's your passion i have my little things that i do like solving a puzzle each day, you know, my little puzzle where it's got the date, uh, the day right. of the month. And um, and that seems to be, that's the right ratio. It takes me like two minutes to do. I get to feel zing, a good little serotonin burst because, hey, I solved it again. If it frustrates me, I don't bear down and make sure that I accomplish it. Like it's a task on my list. It's like, I'll come back to this. And sometimes I don't come back to it and I move on to the next day. And so there's something about my completest personality that says, what, you let the puzzle defeat you? It's an, a mentally healthy thing for me to say, yeah, every time I do that, I assert it's only a puzzle. Right. It's, it's, it's a nothing. You know what I mean? There's been a big Wordle craze lately. And big news was that Wordle just got bought by the New York Times. And I'm really good at words and at word games and that kind of stuff. And yet I didn't jump onto this one because at one point I was playing Scrabble online. And I found that I was spending an hour or two playing Scrabble. And I'm like, what am I doing? That hour or two is writing a book time, writing some right. code time, uh, cataloging my comics time. I, I just can't, in the proportion of those things, justify that. And so I'm hoping that I regularly make choices that are just based on that. If I had to write all this down and show it to somebody else, they would put an eyebrow up at, how much are you watching? Uh, you know, right. what, what's, what's my gift? Like, I like the term guilty pleasure because it really is that. I think I mentioned the other day that I Wipeout became available again. Yes, with and John I Cena. I watched Wipeout with John Cena and Nick, Nicole Byers fr from Peacemaker. You know, so that's they right. must have met, decided they had good chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's like, I there's no justifying why I think that show is just so hilariously funny. <laughs> I don't know that I actively watch it. I watch it while I'm folding laundry. I watch it while I'm doing yes. other things. And, and, and like I've rewatched the Archer series more than I've ever rewatched anything else because it's exactly that. While I'm doing laundry, that's what I have on. And, and I don't know, rewatching something doesn't really give me much. I've already seen it. You know, it doesn't add to my, my what would you call it? My experiences in life. And yet I still laugh out loud at it, how well done it is, how witty it is. It makes me happy. So if I'm looking for that experience of the, the joy of laughter, Archer's a great prescription for that. You know, well, so, from, the, from the psychological standpoint, it's a, a feel good. I mean, you know the feelings and how you feel when you watch it. So watching again, you put yourself in that same type of mood, but you're, you're not having, you're, your brain can shut down. Uh, you know, but quite often I put a show that I've seen, Big Bang Theory or uh, um, Castle or Firefly or some, you know, something Star Trek, <laughs> something yeah. I've seen dozens of times. I put that on in the background if I'm really intense on some code or something like that. And it doesn't distract me, but it gives my brain something sometimes to do that left turn uh and because i know it's coming and i've gone through whole episodes and like oh i didn't even realize it was playing it you know it shut shut off exactly but you know i do the same thing folding clothes making dinner sweeping the floor yeah. throw on the you know star trek exactly it's kind of funny i you and i have that wonderful again we have so many things that we share that same experience of I tend to concentrate better when I give myself a voluntary slight distraction, like music in the background, right. as opposed to dead silence. And, and that doesn't work for Colleen. She really needs to be uh, uh, only the thing she's focusing on most of the time. Whereas, and I don't know, different kinds of music, things with, like when I'm writing, things with lyrics do tend to be a little bit more distraction than what I want. Whereas if I listen to instrumentals, I don't know if you've heard of Osric Tentacles, but they're a great, <laughs> like a rave band. They're okay. it's very much that, you know, 120 beats per minute, fantastically good music by Ed Wynn. I really love them. They're what I put on the most when I'm trying to write 
my I used to write a monthly Lokstack article for my Mensa newsletter. When I'm when I'm writing copy for something, a, a newsletter, a, a magazine article or something, that just kind of it energizes me and it it strikes the right parts of my brain so that I am more florid in my prose. I'm more creative or something like that without it being the words were supplied to me by listening or watching or something like that. I'm not sure if I can explain that, but I know that it works. You know what I mean? So you put yourself in the right mood, the right frame of mind to be productive and, and get it done. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I've discovered that works really good for me. Plus, if it, uh, you know, coding or whatever, sometimes you get stressed and you're getting upset and it's not working and you got a deadline or whatever. Right. But having Star Trek playing in the background it helps that mood it really does so exactly. you know it's you got to shut off because it's yeah look, i hear you it, yeah. no it's it, it's kind of funny i know that there's all kinds of people have their, their different guilty pleasures if you will i don't listen to only good music i'm sure like every time i we go to george see george thorgood in concert and he's like it's kind of the opposite of my prog rock love that Rich, I yes he's just bar <laughs> band rock loud. Roll, but it's perfect for what it is you know what yeah, i mean yeah. like how many songs am i like I'd say probably half a dozen of his hits are like, what do we get drunk? You know what I mean? One bourbon, one shot, one beer. You know? yeah. like, and like, that's so much not me. And yet there I am at the concert singing right along with it. Give me a last night they're, about half past ten. Yeah, they, you know, that's a great <laughs> strikes me. You know, they're great. <laughs> He's a great example. You know, he, he knows what his audience likes. He hits ACDC. You know, there's another example that exactly. they, they, they're, their songs they've got some grunge crunch to it but then it's like three chords it's repetitive and they're very tongue-in-cheek uh innuendos and stuff and, and that's like everything acdc's ever done they've never really exactly. changed that and it's the, perfect <laughs> angus young in his naughty schoolboy outfit yeah that's what the band is about the kids that still like giggle when you know what what lake is there in mexico titty cock i've got big balls <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> got, got, yeah. got big balls and exactly when, <laughs> when we got jason's drum set and he wanted to play and stuff and you know i'm i i had a very strong music instructor so i'm very you know, practice and make sure you're practicing it perfect, you know, and all that jazz. And I told him, I said, look, man, just find some ACDC, put your headphones on and play to it <laughs> because it's, it's the same beat. It's the same speed all exactly the time. That. You're going to build your rock vocabulary. Yes. That down perfect by listening. You know, it's kind of funny. I really do like them, especially like Thunderstruck and stuff where there's a little bit more to it, but I got to tell you the worst new year's Eve I ever had in my life a bunch of college friends went to a, a bar like right on the border of illinois and wisconsin and there was an acdc cover band and they were doing back then it was back in black and highway to hell and various different things and they sucked doing them oh how did I you just, suck you know what I mean? I, 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 that, that was my amazement is like i'm ready to just sit here and you know get yeah howdy headbangers you know that kind of thing and instead they were just drunk or stupid or just didn't get what made acdc winkingly funny that it said it was all aggression or all i don't even know but man i just couldn't wait to get out of there and i was like i'm going to be leaving here at the same time that every other drunk idiot <laughs> is going to be on the road with me how do i you know at 1201 maybe i'll give it until like 1220 when the worst of them are already out of the parking lot i don't know i just remember it being too loud a nightmare of a new year's eve i just couldn't stand wow it. <laughs> so going back a second you were talking about choosing things uh you mentioned osric tentacles i'll make sure and find them put a link to that yeah. so this week i'll give you a tv show recommendation sure. i would not say it's my absolute favorite tv show ever but it is really good and it's a little different um i think it's cbs it's it's called evil have you seen that or heard it i have not i liked it because of the premise and they've changed a little bit and it's enough that we're anticipating the third season because i want to find out what's happening but okay. the premise is that there's this guy who's in the seminary who's going to become a priest but they ask him to investigate uh demonic possessions and things like that okay. so he gets a jewish atheist um to help who's also the computer geek nerd science guy and then they also get this woman who's a psychologist and they hire them and they work as a team to investigate these and right. 
with What's, paranormal investigation it's it's uh, you know okay very interesting. yeah okay. Uh, you yeah. know and it started off i'm thinking oh it's going to be an anthology where every episode's a new investigation but now they've got this overarching storyline going on along with individual things so they got that right balance going uh and it's taken some wild twist to the left a couple times i will look for that yeah that's on cbs i think it's cbs we watch okay. it on uh yeah, I think it is because we watch it on Prime and we got CBS on Prime. Got it. And it's it's kind of like a regular, like you can watch it on regular television. Yeah. Things. Sometimes that I, tames things, if you know what I'm trying to say. Well, you know? I see, uh, I thought it was like a primetime uh yeah. 10 o'clock thing, but they've dropped the F bomb a couple of times and a, and uh, they, they have some very explicit looking sex scenes a few times. So I'm like, maybe that's a, for network TV. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know what I, I mean? I think it I'm, started I'm, off as network TV and now it's on the plus only. So you can they only get it. it. So it's yeah, only, I think, okay, okay. But two seasons and we enjoyed it again. Interesting. I wouldn't say it's like, like the boys. It's like, oh my God, give me season three of the boys as soon as you can. Right. Exactly. But it's like, when's that coming? Okay. We'll have to catch that. Uh, you know, watch you. an episode. A little mental tickler. You know, yeah. it, it, it's, this is, this is a whole episode, but maybe we'll just throw some things out. <laughs> There's all kinds of things where I really, I liked a lot of what I was seeing. And then it ended after two or three seasons and there were still all kinds of good plot lines to go. They didn't uh, wrap everything up. They just kind of like stopped. They ran out of money. The stars moved on. So I really like Penny Dreadful, for instance. Yes, that you was a great that? one. I like a movie called Haven, where, you know, they were- uh, um, Based on British, Stephen King. Jim Court, exactly. Um, it, it, um, I, one of my sweet spots that any number of authors or showrunners have found is I love where they're aware of all that's gone before in terms of monster movies, folklore, that kind of stuff. And they find a way to say, so what would happen if the Dracula met the Wolfman? Uh, what would happen? You know what I mean? Like uh, um, the Chupa Cabra, uh, the legend that goes behind that, is that part of an entire pantheon of <laughs> mythical beasties in Mexico right. or whatever else it might be? And I love where they do interesting combinations and extrapolations of those things into modern times or whatever. So when I, when I see those things, it's really cool to be like, especially uh, some of the twists, you meet all these characters and then maybe like by episode six, you reveal, oh, he's dead. You know what I mean? Right. He's a, a nice looking zombie. Right. But then, <laughs> and all the interesting ways that they get to say, what's a better explanation for vampirism? Oh, it's an anaerobic virus that makes you crave blood. That's why they can live underwater, but they can't stand running water because you know what I mean? Right. Alan Moore played with all those cool things in Swamp Thing in the comic books that yes. he wrote. Yeah. And yeah. some shows have really then embraced that and, and done good things with it. So when they started to have um, movies in what they were going to call the hammer verse, the old hammer horror movie yes. was, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein, Wolfman and stuff like that. And I think Tom Cruise might have done it. Maybe that's why it went star studded too early instead of building with lesser known stars. Yeah, I was really looking forward to well, what happens when jo Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde meet the Wolfman meet. You know what I mean? Here's what I, here's my opinion. That was the uh, the 2017 mummy with uh, him in it they had the go. whole dark universe plans yes but what i think they screwed up on is they did not make that well known uh people didn't understand that they were creating an uh, a universe and they were going to do all the old monster movies revamp right and this is episode one so there's things to look forward to they're yes. not trying to wrap it up in one movie okay right yeah. and i think it was confusing to people. They thought this was connected to the Brendan Fraser mummy movies, which are comedy action. Okay. okay. So I think it, they didn't make it clear what people were getting uh, right from the start. That's pretty good analysis. I mean, it, it's, I, there was a lot of backlash against it. And I was like, I didn't think it was that bad. There's no. all kinds of movies. Boy, there's one called Van Helsing where I thought Hugh it had some of the most, yeah the most amazing action sequences swooping you know uh, uh, uh hanging off of a uh, a church um I, boy i'm being so inarticulate some of the action sequences were so balletic they were so beautiful while being of course violet someone's getting violent they're going to get someone's going to get staked and blood spurt everywhere but they really were like in a big theater i remember being i am totally engrossed in this amazing setting that they've created here 
I wish there would have been more of those. You know what I mean? There's any number of times where that could have been a series. They could have had, you know, Van Helsing versus the next series. Right, of yeah. Stuff like that. Um, so it, it, it's kind of funny. I, I don't know. This is kind of, do I like my horror kind of old style and campy more than modern? Like I said, we just watched the, um, uh, uh, um, there's a cool series called The Movies That Made Us. Uh, yes. and, and they where they have here's the Christmas movie and the Halloween movie and that kind of stuff. And for Halloween, they talked about Halloween, that John Carpenter one. And then he went with um, Friday the 13th. And boy, that series has sucked. You know what I mean? If you really want to see kids get knifed or or scythed or whatever else it might be, but there wasn't any plot to it. It was much, and they even talked about it in this special. It's just a series of scenes with enough threadbare plot to link yeah. them together. And of course, you know, what's the formula? Sex equals death. You know, if you're going to end up doing it because you can't control those wacky teenage hormones, <laughs> here's Jason lurking just off the scene to like run over you with a combine harvester. So I don't even know. They were the amount of violence, the unnecessary violence that. And, and it gets crazy. He dies. He comes back. Oh, he gets yeah, I just, yeah. The fact that that's been uh, to. It all ties together when we talk. That's the low-hanging fruit, lowest common denominator, dancing show crap of horror movies. Right. You know what I mean? They're not even trying anymore. Oh, let's put them on a spaceship. Let's let's you know, Jason, the new blood. And like, wow, I, I just on a, a formula to print money, someone made tons of money off of these. You know, like, I don't know, and you see something really good, like Saw, where, and I, boy, I don't know that I want to use the word good different it, 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 it was really horrifically wow, good, good twist. It, yes it was well done it was horrific it wasn't good in the sense of holy hobby <laughs> it <laughs> exactly. was you know that you yeah it's it a definite enough for every horror movie that had come before that just wasn't oh fire up another chainsaw or yeah. whatever terrible did, thing did you watch the new stuff. halloween kills no i have not we it's watched it and we right. the one in 2018 which is like the third direct sequel to the original right. um, with Jamie Lee Curtis is back yeah. again. Oh, right? she yeah, okay. back again as right. another <laughs> reboot sequel. Um, we liked that one. I thought it was really okay. well done. It was intense. Uh, and it was a good story along with just the oh, Michael's running around killing people. Okay. And then they have the sequel to that. This new one, Halloween Kills. And we got done. We looked at each other like, yeah, that was nowhere near as good as the one a couple years ago. It, they yeah. tried to make a statement and a point. It's like, well, you're missing the point to do that. <laughs> so, so, go ahead. I, 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 our discussion, I just maybe noticed one. I have trivia. Okay, so, good. I was going to ask you so, if you had anything. Uh, <laughs> be, uh, do you have any uh, investment updates or anything? Oh, boy. Uh, the last two days, I've had amazing days. I The market has, the January is often a terrible time for the market. I'm into 102 stocks now. And at one point I had like 99 of my stocks down for the day. Wow. I lost thousands. Uh, it was, uh, I wasn't going to sell off. I was going to hold on and wait for it to come back. But it's really weird to see a year's worth of investment going away in a month. Wow. You know what yeah. I mean? A year's worth of gains, I should say. So uh, they have, there's all kinds of, are we switching from, uh, value from growth to value in some cases yes for the panicky people but th this is a sweeping statement i'm into 102 companies every single one of them in my opinion has the right fundamentals the right story behind it i'm going to wait for the world to re-realize that shopify is a great bet roku is a great bet apple is a great bet and they'll all make their recoveries but it's just you know, i as i mentioned before one of the important observations about what i how i invest it's almost all growth is because i do have time on my side and i do have i don't need this money for right now expenses so that precipitous drop didn't mean hey colleen and i go hungry we can't make rent we can't none of that stuff i will have time to recover but that i that two days ago i had a spectacular day one of my best ever and it's amazing what it does for your mood you know what i mean <laughs> especially certain things i really um Teladoc, for instance, is down compared to that might be the one where the Teladoc and Etsy are the ones where I put the most money into it compared to the, the, the gain that I've gotten from it. Teladoc is actually down. Etsy is actually up. But other things where I've made, I don't know, like a thousand dollar investment, it's tripled. And so I might not have made that much money, but it's really cool to see a 200% gain, if you know what I'm right, trying to say. Right. 
there, there, I have a couple problem children. Having said that, I just recently went into Doximity, which is a, um, uh, uh, not social media only, it is a, a conglomeration of information for doctors so that they have their own network on how oh, to talk about what jobs are available, what um, uh, hospitals are good. Um, it's, it's kind of like that, that big accumulator of medical um, personnel knowledge, if you will. And that has done well for me already. So Doximity, one by name that I just recently invested in. I invested a little bit more into Roblox, um, which is, you might have, you know, it, it, boy, the kids Jason are plays into it. it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's similar to Minecraft in terms of how they're able to create amazing things in this virtual world. And I still have some deep gut part of me going back to our first part of the conversation. I want that physical CD. If this thing only exists in dit, you know, bit space in, in the digital world, NFTs could poof. Roblox could poof. There's all kinds of things that I just, I have to trust a lot to think that those servers are going to stay up forever and that all the money that people have put into creating all these things is really going to continue to exist. I think I've overcome that because there really are some things that, why do I disbelieve that compared to every other massive database that we've created that will continue to exist because there's a need for it. Right. There's a value to it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Coinbase, I have invested a little bit into because they're the, um, let's see, the central source for investigating in various different cryptocurrencies. You know, they're, they're, if you if, one of the things you can do, another pick and shovel play is instead of investing in stocks, why don't you buy some NASDAQ stock and some New York stock exchange stock and some what we used to be called archipelago for you who's who's going to make money no matter what trades are done the people that are doing all those trades they get their tiny little rake off of everyone and yes that comparison to gambling is absolutely apt <laughs> so i have some of those things seem to be not only um the company is good but opportunistically the some of the stocks had fallen because of this overall downturn and it was like i uh, i'm gonna uh I took a little bit of money out of Match Group, which had made me already a lot of money. So that one of the, my theories about how I'm doing this is um, play with the casino's money. I, since my initial stake, I have never put any of Colleen's money in or my other money, if you will. I'm trying to always have this starter grow and it was worth it to cannibalize a little bit. Lately, I've done it from Match, from FICO, from Intuit, things that have really done, had a good run and they probably will continue to have a good run. But I liked their chance to go 5x from this point in time was less than these other chances to go 5x. And so that's why I bought into some of these other companies, Globus Medical, et cetera. Sometimes some things I added small positions, something I opened a new position. So I'm at 102. When I was trying for a long time, I was at 100 because that way I, it's easy to say, How'd you do today? 60% of my stocks were up because it's 60. Now, you know, but but I don't know, some things were just too tempting. So out of, out of all the things that, you know, just that, hey, you know, investment, uh, people who are coming to the Rentless Geekery for investment advice, I really do believe that the things I named in particular, Doximity, Coinbase, uh, Roblox, those are really good bets um, to get into now because there, there really is a big growth on ramp for them. The more that the world becomes available uh, to them, the more that becomes they're aware of them. It's not going to be like, how do you make money betting on pet food? You know what I mean? There's some big ideas from way back in the dot-com bust 20 years ago, 22 years ago, that people were like, I just don't believe that's a good idea. Whereas all of these seem to be sound business, that it's a disruptive technology. It's one thing I'll mention is I bought a little bit of Chewy, having just mocked pet.com and how, wow, you know, that it's I can go out on the pet food store and do all that I need to there. And my, my pet can come with me and sniff things and tell me which one it likes. Chewy seems to have figured out how to do the online version of that yeah. cleanly, elegantly, making money, doing it, controlling their costs, gathering the right information, catering to the right people. Um, sometimes it isn't, uh, sometimes the early bird gets the worm. Sometimes you need like that third bird that looked at how the first two died right, <laughs> and right. not make the same mistakes. And I think Chewy might be that. Kind of like in real estate, now that we've seen Zillow take a big step and then a big fall because of it, Open Door is learning from all of 
Zillow's and Redfin's mistakes and Open Door might be a really good play now in the real estate disruption zone. So I'm, I'm continually trying to learn about that, who's entering those various different markets and, and who seems to have first mover advantage because sometimes it's all about market share and who seems to be the one that learns from stumbles and then does a more elegant version of that same function. You know, and, so. and the companies you believe in, they may be down. So that's the best time to reinvest and stay exactly. with them. You know, that, that's, I get like Motley Fool advice for this whole last month has been stay the course, don't get out. You know, you don't want to sell at a loss. And in fact, if you have extra cash, consider all these good companies that we've told you about, all the good bets you've made, it's on sale. Buy a few more shares because your chance of getting a, 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 a multiplier is even better if it was at 50 and now it's at 30. It might be that you've taken a little bit of a loss, but boy, that stock at 30 is really attractive. And the market agrees with that in certain ways. You know what I mean? It, it's, there's all kinds of still disruptive things to come in the market in terms of we still don't know what's going to happen. Interest rates might start to creep up. Um, the, the false inflation that we're seeing is actually in so many cases price gouging. And so will we see any governmental organization act on you really can't keep jacking gas prices up when there's no reason for it except pure profit. When you see who's making those record profits, there's various different companies that they just, oh, yeah, that's inflation. Oh, yeah, yeah, get them, get, them. get those guys, get those uh, bad actors that are causing all that right. inflation. They're the ones. Oh, well, that's my paranoia, but not unfounded <laughs> based on real, now they're having to come out with what's their quarterly report. In the middle of all this inflation, how did they make even more money than they have in the past? They caused it. Right. So anyway, we'll we'll see. <laughs> how's how's the, the vaults? Because I know you worked on that a lot last year. You were hoping to get done last year it's I, so i'm still i'm at uh 29 going on thirty thousand out of about thirty five thousand. i really did boy um working on the garage kind of threw me off my stride and that went all the way through september i don't know why i didn't do much in the fourth quarter except i was concentrating on other things i have returned but not frequently enough and actually this is uh again a whole nother topic one of the things that i need to worry about is now that i know what i have in my collection and it's substantial i need to worry about insuring things when they're in transit yeah. where i have it now is a, it's a temperature and humidity controlled place and it really is not a flood zone and all the right things no one's going to bust in so it isn't only to guarantee it against oh big theft someone would have to back up an 18 wheeler to take my comics you know what i mean i take it back a small panel van but anyway um they but when I have things going down to CGC to get pressed and graded and so forth, I have to check into where's the, what's the best way to do that? I, um, the post office, USPS, and I think UPS have limits on how much they're willing to uh, insure something for. And right. if I'm sending a $30,000 book, no lie, I have a couple of those and it's only insured to 5,000 and tragedy ensues. I am so fucked. Yeah. So I'm trying to find the insurance company that will allow me to cover besides what I can get from the carrier to make sure that when it's off my site, that it's there, I'm almost certainly CGC and other places are bonded and insured. So that while it's right. in their hands, there's no problems with it whatsoever. But now that I know I have some things of real value, I'm having to make sure that now I don't stumble and say, hey, I sent it and there it sat in a puddle of water on their doorstep for a day. And and my beautiful copy of right. Avengers number one is now toilet right. paper. Totally. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so that's my next big thing is investigating how I'm going to actually start setting things in to get pressed and graded. I only have about 30 books graded currently. And this is actually interesting. The collector's software that I make use of, um, they have, they don't have current price data because they stopped being able to go to go collect for, through their API. But what they do have is their own system of what are the major and the minor keys. And out of my 30,000 comic books, I have about 7,000, like 900 major keys and about 7,700 minor keys, if I remember right. And, you know, in comic book parlance, that's like first appearance of a character, a big character death, a big character wedding, kind of like real it, life it, events, if you will. Right. You know, in and, comic parlance, those are really the only comics you own. The rest are <laughs> pretty much, you know. You know, it's kind of true. Out of my 35,000 comics, if I sell these 8,000, I'm going to get 95% of the value of my collection. Yeah. I have so many things. My complete collection of ROM Space Knight is pretty much worth cover price and any number of other things. But I, I just posted recently, laughingly, you know, I, I 
I got a box that was uh, full of slightly older stuff. And I found I had, I have a whole run of Ghost Rider, you know, from one to 77 or whatever else it might be. Ghost Rider number one, I've never really loved this title. I couldn't believe that it was when Marvel and DC were still trying to figure out what movies to make out of their vast intellectual property. Ghost Rider was early because Nicolas Cage really liked it. And it's like, man, you've got Spider-Man Adventures, Daredevil, Thor, Hulk, and you're going to make Ghost Rider? Right. Oh, my God. It's, it's like picking out the worst well, of them. If, if nothing else, <laughs> let's take the one character that probably wouldn't make that much money anyway. Let's experiment, see what we can do, what works, what doesn't. And you yeah. ruin that movie, so we make the other ones better. <laughs> you you know, ruin an entire franchise. Yeah. But it's kind of funny. Boy absolute analogy to my stock investing you know what how do you want to make money you don't buy microsoft and apple because everybody knows about them you buy shopify where it's not quite well known but as it rises you ride that rocket ship i am so well, pleased that by having moon knight about to be a blockbuster movie by having guardians of the galaxy who knew that that movie would do as well as it would right by having ghost rider so like i said my, my copy of ghost rider might be worth like seven thousand dollars nice like, really really for for something and what i laughed about was boy i have certain things like if i make money any money off a of ghost rider or spawn or gi joe where it's like i'm a completist so i'm buying these but these are terrible titles the writing is terrible the yeah. artwork is beautiful it's a perfect vapid comic book you know spawn has always had great artwork but boy, the, the title is just so repetitive. And so there's nothing in the origin. It's just, man, it's it's lowest common denominator yeah. comics. And yet it's 300 issues in. It's been going on forever. Yeah. So when I one day sell Spawn, I'll be laughing all the way to the bank. because and Someone like, will be oh, happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I'm going to go to a good home. Someone's going to be so happy to get all my good Spawns. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yay. <laughs> so before your um, trivia, uh, I have Oculus, two updates for Oculus. Yes, yes. Um, I've been having some fun with. Um, Beat Saber, if you do get an Oculus, Beat Saber is the game. Uh, we were having a great time with that one. Okay, um, Beat Saber, all right. It's like uh, rock, it's like rock Band with lightsabers. Uh, so <laughs> That's an interesting, okay, what, a, yeah. what, a, what an amalgam that is. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you got this thumping <laughs> beat music going on in your ears yeah. you're holding lightsabers and you're slashing blocks mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so it was a good time okay. um but anyway so when you take your oculus quest you have that store uh to get the games but if you hook it up to your computer it now essentially becomes a rift which is their other product uh, okay. So it accesses the rift store and runs the rift software which okay. comes from your computer so my computer needs updated to run that well, but it does kind of do it. Um, but I, I also need a longer cord, uh, three foot cord. You're sitting there. <laughs> right. no, no, I, yeah. I can't really get my full range of motion going. Right. Either. Exactly. Okay. But uh, I did hook it up and I clicked the desktop button and psh, there was my desktop right floating in front of me and I could pull up man, a keyboard. That's the and, future, man. That's yeah. cool. Uh, okay. that, I, I was thinking like, okay, how can I do this and try a Zoom thing so we could record it? You know, I, I'll look into that more just to see what's available because uh, you can stream it. So I'm thinking if I stream it back and record there, you know, I could probably rig something up. Um, okay. So that that's possible. I got to get one. You are the devil. I got to get one because <laughs> I really want to try these things too. And I just, you know what I mean? It really is only a couple hundred bucks for some yeah. this whole now, new experience. You know, it's, that's what life is about. I, I, like, you know, you got a $7,000 ghost rider. <laughs> exactly. It's not only about having more toys, more things. It's about new experiences. Yeah. What's the national park I want to go to. What's the next? And, and that's the thing. Headset I want to go on to. Uh, now, the hardware on the Rift is better than the hardware on the Quest. They, I don't know why. Maybe the power, because it, it runs off a battery as opposed to the Rift being plugged in. So if you do get a Rift, you get slightly better graphics when you're hooked up to the computer, but you can't play that alone it has to always be hooked up so you're giving up a little graphics for okay. that flexibility uh, with it. the quest so the other thing i did was get this program rift only called 360 uh photos or something like that okay with my phone you probably have it where you do the panoramic photos you spin in a circle yes and it, and it, it puts it all together stitched puts it, it in so 3d around the you panorama. Exactly. yes 
it yeah. was very cool. I when uh, Gina and I went and saw a Christmas story at Lorraine Palace, I did that and I pulled that up and I'm looking around. And I'm looking like there's my wife sitting in the seat at the Palace Theater and I'm looking all around at the palace. All around. And That's... we we have camping trips uh, in panoramic. We have when we went to Maine and we're in the ocean panoramic. We have um, I've never done that, even though I've had that capability to stitch things together for 20 years. I've never yeah. done that. It, well, the, cool. the phones okay. now, they do it. You just hold it and you just turn slowly in a circle and it gives you a big, long photo. It gives you a saccade, exactly. Yeah, and the first time I ever experienced that, my God, it must have been um, 83. No lie. We went to um, Epcot. Uh, oh, yeah. Epcot, like last spring break type thing. And they had a thing where you, you stand in the middle of a place and then all around you projected. And for instance, one of them was it's a parade going down Main Street, and you're in it. You're in the yeah, middle of it. And no matter where you look, it's just... Da, 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 da. And I just... That was the future. And it's taken a while for the world to get to that. That's from 83, right? So yeah. quick math, you know, 37 years ago, right? <laughs> 30, 39. I got to get to this 2022 now. But it's... I, I love the fact that that used to be special Zappo cams that only Disney had. And now you and it's your phone... Right yeah. The, you can do it. That's really cool. So that that was fun. I, I got to get a longer cord so we can look at all these great 3D. I mean, to me, that right there is the coolest thing so far. Yeah, the games. Great. We've got games. OK, the yeah. Beat Saber is fun playing and slicing all the things and that. Um, but man, looking at those 360 degree photos that I was there, like I'm there again. That's just really cool. So, OK, I, I got to get going. Give me your trivia. So uh, the shape. Halloween, he wears a mask. Who is that mask mask a model of? Oh my gosh. It's a real person. It's not just a generic thing. Wow. Halloween, Michael. Yes, Michael Myers. I may, I may have known this at one time. Um This is cool Barbette trivia. You'll, you'll, yeah, yeah, I have no idea. It, it's William Shatner. Really? How cool is that? That is way cool. <laughs> so they, they have a little story about how they went into a place and they actually had, you know, various different masks of various different people. And Leonard Nimoy looked different enough that they didn't want to have it. They wanted it to be kind of blank and terrifyingly blank. And what they got from William Shatner was just what they wanted. He has a, a a chiseled Roman kind of a face, you know, and, and when he's not overacting as he was prone to do in those days, he actually has a, so that's what it is. William Shatner Here's is your claim that my face is so bland that they gave it to a serial exactly. killer. Yeah, that's right. We, we were looking for the blandest of the bland. Bill, get over here. That's no, great. That's oh, he, he probably that's loves it. That's <laughs> another, another little bit of fame, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's kind of funny. All I'm right. sure that stroked his ego just right. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again for your flexibility in doing it today. Yeah, no problem, it today. I boy, I, glad you're I better. Detail, but I really needed a day to uh, recover from something that I ate. See so, now, uh, if we were doing the through the Oculus, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe it would have. Uh... <laughs> yeah, really. Don't don't follow me down from. <laughs> don't look down. Don't look down. <laughs> exactly. Oh, All right, man. All later. Right. Take care, Stephen. Bye bye. <laughs> You have been listening to the Relentless Geekery Podcast. Come back next week and join Alan and Stephen's conversation on Geek Topics of the Week.